We hit the city with a fusillade of smoke canisters and high-impact incendiary rounds from fires, all obscuring. Within moments, the entire cityscape is covered, utterly covered. Chaff is filling the air along with smog and smoke. The defenders are now shooting into the dark. They cannot see. I perform as I have across a thousand battlefields, across tens of centuries since we originally raised our flag on Istvan. Yes, I am what is called a veteran of the Long War, a war that has raged without respite for ten millennia. Around me are my compatriots, my competitors. On wings of flame we descend, the raptor hosts of the Black Legion. We drop into the firing platforms and annihilate the gunners and their support staff. The way needs to be cleared if we are to make our four-hour deadline for the taking of this world. Two hours have elapsed and our escalating assault now reaches its culmination. The few mewling whelps left in charge of my target barely deserve the name of soldier. Their attention on themselves instead of the skies. I finished all two dozen of them in less than that many seconds, tearing them apart with my chainsaw all too easily. My position secure. I look down on the battlefield before the citadel on which I now perch. Our message goes out to them over their vox. You have been lied to. Your commanders are using you to cover their withdrawal. In less than an hour they will be out of range and will fall silent. You are being used to cover their retreat. Surrender and you will be fairly treated. You need not die for them. It repeats endlessly across their vox. I look down with my god gifts and see through the walls and crenellations. I see their command deep within the main barbican below the keep. All seems active but controlled until my brethren of the warp talons slice their way into reality amidst their screens, chairs and carcasses. The warp talons make short work of the marines and officers inside. Only a few of those who are here today wear the blue of the ultramarines, but not even their power armor will save them. The vast majority are of the guard, mere mortals standing to defy the passing of giants. But we know what they will do, where they will be, when they will advance, when they will retreat. Like a pantomime I have seen a hundred times, they fall back on the roads instilled in them by their dogmatic adherence to the Codex Astartes. Hence all of us have studied it, all the better to defeat them. We know exactly what they will do. It is almost child's play to corral them, to destroy them. The Warp Talons are soon joined in the Astartes section of the defences, a mere hundred feet away by a teleportarum strike, as a score of the Guard of Abaddon appear out of thin air. Fire erupts from them, and sighs through the command of the marines as if they were wearing paper bags, not power armor. We know where to shoot, when and how. The carnage is great. Some put up a valiant defense, even challenging our officers in melee, but they are swiftly swept away. Warp talents making sure no stragglers escape the sleigh stack. My part played. The defenses are gone and as such five dropships thunder across the landscape, landing at different areas of the army, cutting it into pieces and then surrounding them with tactical devastating units. You have been lied to. Your commanders are using you to cover their withdrawal. In less than an hour they will be out of range and will fall silent. You are being used to cover their retreat. Surrender, and you will be fairly treated. You need not die for them. We clear out their defences, culling as we go. But they will bend the knee, or they will die. Commissars are overrun, as across the battlefield we hunt these vertebrae. Again, we know where they will be and in what numbers. We remove them and key staff, like surgeons. Soon this army will be ours. Ours to hurl at another of its kind on another world, and smash both in the name of the Dark Gods. But in so doing, we will take another objective in our onward march out of the eye. As our forces move through the tentacles like smoke on a hurricane, they are soon met by lines of men on their knees, 
hands behind their backs in defeat. Entire companies of them, as intended. Pockets of resistance are swiftly crushed at a frantic pace. The more brutally this is done, this cancer of resistance is removed, the more of the body we will retain. This army is now ours. All it will take is to thin the herd. Any NCOs, any weaklings, they must be dealt with. The NCOs, the day-to-day -day leaders, they are segregated. Then they are fed to the warp talons as tribute. There shall be trials, of course, to deal with these elements, the weak. But when we leave this planet, those that come with us will be hardened. They will be warriors of the dark gods. Warriors beholden to the Black Legion. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, and I wish to introduce you to the forces and factions of the Wyma 40k universe. And what a treat we have today. For I must profess to having a definite soft spot for these, one of my most favorite evil factions. Clad all in black, with an air of Vader meets Warhammer, they are as iconic a force for chaos as the Ultramarines are for the Imperium. For today, we are to introduce the very legion of Horus Lupkal, the Warmaster. Yes. We shall explore the dreaded 16th Legion, the dark force now known across the galaxy and warp alike as the Black Legion. They are called by three names, the Lunar Wolves, the Sons of Horus, or the Black Legion, so sometimes it can be confusing at the start, but this just makes them an interesting and dynamic force with a rich heritage to uphold. Now, let us lean on existing wisdom to begin the introduction. To quote, to quote, Black Legion. The Black Legion are the only traitor legion to have changed their names in 10,000 years of exile. Originally created as the Lunar Wolves, the Emperor renamed them the Sons of Horus in honor of their actions during the Ulanor Crusade. After the Horus Heresy, Abaddon renamed the Legion once more, rejecting the name of their Primarch, whom he regarded with contempt after the Rebellion's failure. During the Heresy, the Sons of Horus served as the War Master's Praetorians through his campaigns. They were the first to remove the icons of the Emperor from their armor, replacing them with the Eye of Horus, an image that would become a symbol of dread throughout the Imperium. They fought with pride and unthinkable ferocity, knowing that they were the chosen amongst the Warmaster's new order. When the Emperor defeated Horus, the Legion's morale was extinguished. Their patron, their father, had been taken from them, and they launched a costly but successful raid to recover Horus's body from the Loyalists. Factions in the other traitor legions later blamed the Sons of Horus for initiating the rout from Terra by retreating into warp space with the body of the Warmaster, leaving the Horde below leaderless. But the battle for Terra was lost the moment Horus fell, and no power in the universe could have brought victory to the forces of chaos after that. In the Eye of Terra, the Sons of Horus fought ferocious battles with the other legions for possession of key worlds and resources fighting to re-establish themselves as the preeminent legion. The Sons of Horus worshipped one god after another, and each time more and more of their number gave themselves up to possession by demons. Over the centuries they were bled white in a succession of conflicts with the other traitor legions. Their internecine warfare eventually culminated in the destruction of the Thun's fortress by a combined force of their rivals to add to the ignominy of defeat. The body of the War Master was stolen, and attempts were made to clone him, much to the horror and revulsion of his remaining legionaries. Denied the genetic and spiritual father, the Sons of Horus swore allegiance to Ezekiel Abaddon, captain of the First Company, and hailed him as the new War Master. One of Abaddon's first edicts was to reject the name of Horus and the Legion's title. He ordered the remaining space marines to paint their armor black to mark their shame, and then led them in a lightning raid to destroy Horus's body 
and the misshapen clones created from it. The Legion's gigantic command ship, the Vengeful Spirit, and its attendant fleet disappeared into the obscuring nebulae at the very edge of the Eye of Terror, which were to serve as a hidden base for Abaddon and his warriors, who are now known as the Black Legion. The Legion has launched attacks across the breadth of the Imperium ever since, often vanishing as swiftly as they arrive. Abaddon and his warriors fought hard to regain their honour and rebuild their reputation, throwing themselves into the most dangerous conflicts they could find. At first, Abaddon won the grudging respect of the surviving traitor legions, but as his deeds became ever bolder and his list of extraordinary achievements grew, respect turned into active support. His impassioned words have since fanned the smouldering resentments of the traitor legions into the raging fires of hatred. Champions of many legions and gods now vie to fight for Abaddon in the colours of his Black Legion. The Black Legion is made up of many warbands, whose appearance and motivations vary wildly, but are guided by the implacable will of Abaddon the Despoiler, and so broadly employ the same tactics in battle. The Legion has preference for close assault over ranged combat, and the swift application of extreme force to disrupt or neutralize key targets. The frequency of these attacks increases exponentially, applying a constant and escalating pressure on the enemy, and gradually crushing their ability to muster a coordinated defense. Eventually, the Black Legion commanders and their chosen launch a devastating attack at the crucial moment, usually a teleport strike by warriors in Terminator armor which breaks the back of the enemy forces. End quote. Even the name, the Black Legion, is a sneer at the past. For the Black Legion may have at its core the old sons of Horus, the Lunar Wolves before that, but it is no Legion. For, as we have heard, all who are willing to bend the knee to Abaddon can join the Black Legion, so it comprises Astartes of nearly every single gene seed, as rebelling loyalist chapters are also amongst its ranks. Even so, it is still led by Abaddon the Spoiler, and his are the tactics of the Sons of Horus. To quote, Black Legion Warbands The Black Legion is the largest of the traitor legions inhabiting the Eye of Terror, vastly outnumbering even their closest rivals. As long as a warrior is willing to bow before Abaddon the Despoiler and take the oath of obedience, he may join the Black Legion. During the centuries of warfare and acts of vengeance since the Horus Heresy, Space Marines from dozens of chapters and other legions have joined the Despoiler. Now, the Black Legion boasts warlords and warbands from almost every permutation of chaos worship, depraved doctrine, and ruinous faith. Usually, these warbands work in isolation, raiding planets and pillaging the Imperium in the name of their master, but largely pursuing their own agendas. Their preferred style of warfare is to engage the foe swiftly in close quarters combat and to cut off any chance of retreat. They advance relentlessly towards the lines of their enemies, laying down their hails of fire and bellowing dark oaths as they press forwards. Wherever their foe presents weakness, the Black Legion are swift to exploit it, sending their elite warriors to eradicate a collapsing flank or to slaughter enemy champions who have left themselves exposed. Warbands vary greatly in size, from a few score heretic Astartes to as many as several hundred. Each such force boasts its own transports, battle barges, heavy landing craft, war machines and demon engines, as well as throngs of fanatical cultists who charge screaming into the fray. A lone warband can reduce Imperial or Xenos outpost to ruin, bombarding the enemy's defences from on high as warriors on the ground close in for the kill. This gives the tyrannical Chaos Lords who lead these warbands free reign to maraud as they please, sating their thirst for carnage and power without the need to form lasting alliances with their brethren. However, 
when Abaddon calls the warbands gather. Their oaths to a war master force them to put aside their hatreds and feuds to fight alongside the Legion United. Even so, there is no denying that the Black Legion remains an alliance of traitors. The warlords therein are constantly scheming against their rivals, vying for prominence and glory, and undermining their contenders' achievements, even when they are not openly battling amongst themselves. Only the collective fear of the Despoiler forces them to suffer a cooperation. Fear and the chilling memory of the fates of those who have crossed him. The Black Legion has recruited countless warbands of every stripe to their cause. Though some of these still claim autonomy, they have all bent the knee to Abaddon the Despoiler and all wear some variant of gold and black in honour of their adopted faction. Many warbands worship one of the Chaos Gods above the others, adorning their black battle plate with icons, trophies and the favoured colours of their patron in the hope of attracting more divine favour and perhaps ascending beyond the Black Legion to claim mastery of their own fate. Many traitor legions are counted amongst these hosts, for Abaddon's strength as a leader is impossible to deny. But here are four as examples. Hounds of Abaddon Within the ranks of the Black Legion, there are thousands of devotees of corn. The Hounds of Abaddon revel in close combat, where they can spill the greatest volume of blood for their god, using chain axes, lightning claws, or even their own fangs. The hounds are currently led by Thrixos Hellbreed, Admiral of the Black Fleet. He has won great favour with Korn due to his skill at launching ship-to-ship -ship ambushes, and has a reputation for initiating spectacular boarding actions. Sons of the Cyclops Consisting of the followers of Zinch, Sorcerers and their rubrique, the Sons of the Cyclops hold a disproportionate amount of power within the Black Legion. This is largely through the ceaseless efforts of the Warlords that have led them, invaluable psychers such as Zarafeston and Yigeth Mor, the Deceiver. Gifted seers and diviners, they make up the core of Abaddon's advisors, peering into the future for him and guiding his Black Crusades. Bringers of Decay The Plague God has a strong following within the Black Legion, under the dominance of Skyrak Slaughterborn. The Nurgalites have converted many to their cause. In battle, the Bringers of Decay are Abaddon's plague carriers and heralds of contagion, appearing before other warbands to sow infection and sickness. This could also be why many other warbands will have little to do with the Warbringers, repelled by the blessings of the plague god they bear. Children of Torment Under the guidance of such warlords as Devram Korda and Zagthian the Broken, the followers of Slanesh that have joined the Black Legion are collectively called the Children of Torment. These traitors have sided with the spoiler so they might wallow in the anguish he spreads and bathe in the gushing blood of his victims. The Children of Torment are despised by the Emperor's children, who see them as traitors to Fulgrim and puppets of Abaddon. End quote. But these entries do not speak of the accumulated dread that has come from the past, from the name of the Legion, the Lunar Wolves, and then later, the Sons of Horus. Twenty legions of Adeptus Astartes, space marines, were created by the Emperor, led by a Primarch, a genetic template. The template of the Lunar Wolves was Horus Lupercal, the Warmaster himself. Before he had been discovered, the legion took part in the Unification Wars and was the force sent to the moon to claim it in the name of the Emperor. In scant seven hours from start to finish, the 16th legion took Luna, the grimdark name of the moon and gained their name, the Lunar Wolves, for in them was the rage and power of a veritable wolf pack. The Lunar Wolves then went on to be one of the premier forces of the Crusade, perfecting the art of rapid and brutal assault. Their decapitation strikes were the thing of legend, and easily outshone even the Blood Angels and the dreaded World Eaters in their speed and ferocity. But the Lunar Wolves 
should not be construed as berserkers, as the other two forces can be. In the Lunar Wills was the cold fire, not the hot. They performed their roles perfectly, akin to the sons of Gulliman or Fulgrim, in their precision in this arena of war. When Horus, later named Lupercal by his legion, was found first amongst all the Primarchs, the legion was only augmented. Despite being a thing of terror under the tutelage of the Emperor, Horus became a leader and general akin to the heroes of old. He was merciful where he could be, and always strove to improve the lives of the people who he conquered. The art of bloody war was engaged with such force that he attempted to shorten any potential confrontation by fear alone. But it was out of a wish to prevent grueling wars of attrition that would only harm any world he brought into compliance far more than his own forces. In this way, it was perceived that the harder one hit initially, the more merciful one would be in the long run. Hence it was that the fall of Horus was not only the most devastating blow to the Emperor, as it was performed by his most powerful son, the War Master, but also because it was the son that should never have fallen. The one the Emperor had trained the most, had imparted his vision to the most of all his sons. When Horus architected the downfall of the most powerful Orc Empire the Crusade had yet encountered, the Emperor elevated him to War Master, the leader of all of the Crusade, for he trusted Horus above all others. This he did so he could go home to Earth, to Terra, and perform a very secret thing, a very secret labor. But for that, we should discuss another time. After a time, Horus was given the singular honor of being permitted to rename his legion, so he chose the name the Sons of Horus. Of course, there is much more to all of this than I am saying, but this is only an introduction after all. The nuances we shall get to at another time. When Horus Lupercal fell to evil, was seduced by the dark whisperings of the gods of the warp, he fell hard, and with him he took the majority of the armed forces of humanity. He led them, over the course of seven years, to the very gates of the Emperor's Palace on Terra. There, the dreaded siege of the Imperial Palace occurred over a course of weeks. But finally, Horus was outmatched, as remaining Royalist sons of the Emperor returned with all of their legions with them. Horus challenged the Emperor by dropping his shields, for more details, please see my entry on Rogal Dawn, the Praetorian of Terra. But in short, Horus may have slain his brother Sanguinius, and then went on to mortally wound the Emperor, but he himself was ended. Destroyed utterly to the least and the last by the Master of Mankind. From there, the traitor forces were pushed back again and again by the Loyalists, in what is called the Scouring. They were driven from normal space over a long period of horrifically intense conflict until their tattered ruins finally hid in the area space where the warp and reality merge, the Eye of Terror. In all of this, Abaddon was in seclusion. When he returned, his actions were swift and decisive. He gathered his leaderless brothers around him and began a pathway to power that would see him end on the closest thing to a throne the Dark Forces permit outside of themselves. So let us hear the basics of this character from the Codex itself, as it is brief. A full entry on this terror will come in the future. To quote. Abaddon the Despoiler, Warmaster of Chaos. The name of Abaddon, Warmaster of Chaos, has become a bitter curse within the Imperium. During the Great Crusade, Abaddon rose to captain of the first company of the Lunar Wolves Legion. Such was his tactical skill and physical prowess, it was rumoured that he may have been a clone son of Horus. When the heresy came to a head, it was clear that Abaddon's loyalty lay with his Primarch. He led the Terminators of the Sons of Horus across Istvan, Yerand, and Terra itself. Abaddon's anguish at his master's death drove him deeper into madness and hatred than any mortal should ever sink. Before retreating, Abaddon took up the Warmaster's body and fought his way out of the quickly deteriorating battle. 
With their cadaverous prize, the legion fled before the emperor's armies. When Abaddon returned, it was at the head of a diabolic horde ravaging star sisters from the Eye of Terror. His Chaos Space Marines, now the Black Legion, were at the forefront of the attack, destroying all in their path. During this first Black Crusade, Abaddon formed many blood pacts with the Chaos Gods. Below the Tower of Silence, he recovered a demon sword of prodigious power, making him nigh unstoppable. Since then, Abaddon has dreamed of forging an empire of chaos upon the ruins of the Imperium. More Black Crusades have followed, each achieving some dark purpose that even the mightiest sages of the Imperium cannot discern. It is said that he alone has the power to unite the traitor legions and finish the treachery began 10,000 years ago. Now, as Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade reaches its peak, Cadia has finally been overrun. Though the planet itself has fallen, possession of the Cadian Gate, the only stable path from the Eye of Terror, hangs in the balance. Should Abaddon triumph, the Black Tide of Chaos will pour from the Eye of Terror along the length of the Crimson Path to strike at the most prized worlds of all. Holy Terror itself. The Black Crusades Perhaps once in ten generations, a truly great champion of chaos will arise in the depths of the Eye of Terror. Through the power of his implacable will and the favor of the Dark Gods, his champions bring about an unsteady alliance between the infernal scions of the Warp, drawing together a terrifying army of space marines, demons, mutants, and renegades. A Black Crusade is so vast it darkens the skies. In the years preceding each titanic invasion, the hellforges of the demon worlds echo with the clangor of monstrous machines and nightmare industry, churning out armor and weaponry for the wars to come. Demon engines are roused from their embittered slumbers, and warring factions vie for command of the massed warbands of heretic Astartes that will form the Grand Invasion's rank and file. When a Black Crusade is finally launched, the warp vomits forth the diabolic hordes of chaos, armies of wretched mutants, hosts of demons, twisted monsters the size of buildings, numberless masses of, of cultists, wild tribes of abhumans, and terrifying chaos titans. Spearheading these nightmarish hosts are the chaos space marines, united behind their champions in their desire to wreak untold destruction upon the Imperium. The most destructive Black Crusades have been those led by Abaddon the Despoiler. Thirteen times has the War Master rampaged from the demon worlds of the Eye of Terror to wreak havoc upon his mortal enemies, his hosts plunging into the Imperium like an envenomed blade. Every attack has sent the Imperium reeling and ravaged worlds close to the Eye, but the Thirteenth Crusade dwarfs all those that have gone before. Many Imperial Strategos have theorized that the first twelve campaigns were mere precursors to the current invasion, each seemingly unrelated event paving the way to the same goal. The fall of Cadia, the coming of the Great Rift, and the ultimate invasion of Terror. Abaddon intends to succeed where his predecessor Horus failed, to break the Imperial Palace wide open and tear the Emperor's corpse from the Golden Throne. Over the millennia, each of his conquests has gradually paved the way from the Eye of Terror towards the Sol system. Less obvious, however, is that along that path, his actions have gradually unpicked the veil between real space and the warp. During the course of his long years on the threshold of the Eye, Abaddon discovered a strange truth about the barrier between the Materium and Immaterium. Dotted across the galaxy were ancient structures of black stone, stark and monolithic on the outside, but extremely complex within. There were many of these upon the fortress world of Cadia, known as pylons to the planet's militarized populace. They were so old that none gave them a passing thought. It was Abaddon's belief that these structures were the very thing that maintained the stability of the Cadian Gate. Something about them kept the energies of the warp from spilling through the Eye of Terror into real space. For thousands of years, the Despoiler sent his agents across the galaxy to locate these monoliths of Blackstone. He spent many years calling in old alliances, 
striking demonic bargains and invoking ancient pacts with the traitor legions and their corrupted primarchs. Thread by tenuous thread, the despoiler put together a plan to isolate and destroy these structures, using false objectives or even entire Black Crusades to conceal his motives. Over the course of several world-scouring invasions, Abaddon shattered, toppled or blasted apart these structures wherever he found them, sometimes in person, at other times with his agents, his flagship, the Planet Killer, or the immense Blackstone Fortress co-opted during the Gothic War. The last of and greatest of these destructive campaigns was levelled at Cadia itself. Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade brought about so much death and destruction that his demonic allies could breathe real space wherever they wished and be sustained indefinitely by the unbridled mayhem that raged around them. The demolition of the strange black monolith scattered across Cadia's surface was finally achieved. The capstone of a great design that had seen the cataclysmic effects of Pandorax, Fenris, the plant of the sorcerers, and a dozen worlds beside, tied together into one galaxy-wrecking whole. Suddenly, all the manifold armies of Chaos were free to pour into real space like blood from a deep wound. True to his claims, Abaddon had succeeded in ripping open the gates of hell. As the galaxy has split along its length, with warp storms raging in a hundred locations or more, those traitor legions and renegade chapters who have sworn allegiance to the Warmaster have formed the vanguard of the invasion. They are a broad-headed spear that has plunged deep into the heart of the Cadian system and emerged from the other side. Abaddon cares little how many casualties are amassed as his great agenda comes to fruition. His only concern is that enough blood is spilled to saturate the battlefields of the Imperium's defenders, and in doing so summon more demonic armies to his cause. This is a strategy Abaddon intends to see replicated on world after world, as he extends the Crimson Path, each planetary invasion taking the Chaos Space Marines closer to Terra with the armies of the Demon Lords following in their wake. With Cadia reduced to ruin, the Kikatrix Maledictum is being effectively weaponized by Abaddon's invasion. It spills out behind the 13th Black Crusade, roiling and growing more violent in Abaddon's wake, agitated by the scale of the Black Legion's many slaughters. Simultaneously, dozens of renegade chapters from the Warp Anomaly, once known as the Maelstrom, are pouring out into the Segmentum Solar, forcing the Space Marines and their Primaris reinforcements to spread themselves thin as they fight on hundreds of fronts. Abaddon has driven a talon of unreality into Seg... Segmentum Solar. Its onset heralding the doom of the Imperium. The High Lords of Terror live in constant fear of real space collapsing entirely and are sending every military force they can muster to halt Abaddon's rampage. As the drama plays out to its desperate conclusion, one thing remains certain. Unending war. End quote. Abaddon slew a clone of his own father, Horus, which had been created by the apothecarian Fabius Bile, thus ending any potential to split the remains of the Sons of Horus and instill a puppet figurehead at the beck and call of Fabius. Hence we heard how the Legion was changed, rebirthed, as a thing not only lunar wolves or Sons of Horus, but a force unto itself. Something new. Abaddon is now so mighty, he has a permanent herald, despite him being developed only recently in the lifespan of the Warhammer universe. To quote, Harkon World Claimer, Herald of the Apocalypse. Before every doom, there is a portent. Before every apocalypse, a sign. Harkon World Claimer is that dark omen given form. And the otherworldly destruction he heralds is the coming of the Warmaster himself, Abaddon the Despoiler, Lord of the Black Legion. Harkon Worldclaimer takes a heinous joy in his role as the mouthpiece of Abaddon, for it is he that proclaims the death of worlds. 
He does so not with some quotidian threat or hollow boast, but by driving a spear of terror and confusion deep into the heart of citizen and soldier alike. In such a fashion, he prepares the way for the coming of the Black Legion, his raptor hosts descending on tongues of flame to bring panic and despair with each murderous onslaught. Long ago, the traitor legions learned the value of fear, a plant undermined by doubt, or even better yet, paralyzed by it, is one already half conquered. The world claimer is a scholar and collector of dark knowledge as well as a leader of men, and he knows the power of words well chosen. He has studied the Grimoire Nostromo, the vilest of treatises written in Night's Blood by the Primarch Curs. He has unearthed the clotted scrolls, learned well of the threats growled by Angron before he was consumed by those berserker rages that gave his legion their reputation as eaters of worlds. He has even delved into the dread books of Magnus, though it cost him a good part of his sanity to do so. In his studies he has learned much. When he delivers his fell message, broadcast not only from his loud halo array, but the vox grills and cankerous throats of a thousand acolytes, the raw and gloating hatred that drips from each syllable can shatter cohesion, cause mass surrenders, and even drive men to suicide. Though many heralds would consider their duty done upon their lord's arrival, Harkon world claimer revels in bringing destruction in person as well as from afar. He hastens to where the planet's denizens are coordinating their defences, to winding supply lines, secreted war rooms, and remote command bunkers, and there he strikes. Descending from the skies alongside vast flocks of raptors, Harkon plunges towards the nerve centres of the enemy's war efforts. With thunderous bellows, he proclaims to his foes below that the hour of their doom has arrived, and that the slaughter shall not cease until the earth has been anointed with every last drop of their blood. And this is no mindless bluster. While the foe scrabbles to intercept World Claimer, drawing forces from the front lines to drive back his assaults, the Chaos armies on the ground move in to capitalize on the confusion, tearing into disorganized flanks and crumbling, reforming battle formations. Upon landing, Harkon is swift to join the slaughter. His cruel promises only ring louder as he slashes his way through the fray, sending waves of dread rippling across the enemy's tattered ranks. The assault on the foe's morale escalates as he singles out defiant generals and champions, launching himself towards them and impaling them with practice efficiency. Such gruesome displays demonstrate the inevitability of Abaddon's will, and the wholesale butchery of the embattled world's greatest warriors eradicate any fragments of hope that remain on the planet. Harkon's demon-touched relic, the Hellspear, has tasted the blood of monarchs, Xenos tyrants, and even Chaos lords over his long service as Herald of the Despoiler, and each demoralizing kill invigorates him, drives him to further acts of bloodshed. But it is not only the breasts of men and aliens into which the spear is plunged. It has become a symbolic act for Harkon upon making landfall, to drive his spear deep into the world's crust and roar out the fell promise that within eight days and eight nights it will fall. And he has yet to be proved false. End quote. And now we come to my favourite bit. The summing up, where I can go off script. There are many things that are said between players of factions to get the blood flowing, the hackles up, but few have endured as many taunts as the Legion. Abaddon has for decades been dubbed Failbaddon the Armless. Failbaddon because his frequent Black Crusades never seem to avail him aught. The Armless, as his old figure, had a design weakness, where the arms used to literally fall off. But, like the taunts thrown at the Dark Angels, I must now state that these memes are old and no longer check out. Time for them to end. For Abaddon is not a failure. He has now proven this beyond any shadow of a doubt. The old question of the chicken or the egg. With the Black Legion, it is never a question of either or. It is a question of where and when. For they will take both 
Thank you very much. Why do I say this? Well, the constant trumpeted cry of The planet broke before the guard! Bravo! Because, as per the statement above, the chicken or the egg. The Black Legion didn't care which broke first, guard or planet, as one would mean the end of the other. So who cares? The Legion obliterated both. Cadia, it is gone. And this one action is but the reward for a plan that many have ignored or not understood. Many will scream retcon as if it were a dirty word. But this is actually a site for newer players, so the new trumps the old here. Not always to my liking, but it is the criteria by which I try to present the introductions. But even so, this is actually a turn of events that returns the timeline to what it should be. Allow me to explain. For there was once a worldwide campaign run by Games Workshop, and in it, they were to decide the result of the 13th Black Crusade. But all went awry for GW, as it was chaos that won. So let us all be clear that this is as it should be. Players played across the world, and it was chaos that came together, that organized, and then subsequently won the 13th Black Crusade. But now we know why it took 13 Crusades. It doesn't matter how many Crusades there are, or were, as long as losses were replenished. As time means little to most of the Chaos Legions, so by that rationale, Abaddon has been rather swift, I would say. But people forget who Abaddon was, and they refuse to believe who he is today. What he has become. It is easy to scoff when it, one is utterly ignorant. The thing here is that many read the Horus Heresy books and see him, Abaddon, just as one warrior in a time of legends. This is true, from a certain point of view. But in reality, it misses everything. Why was Abaddon able to slay a clone of his father, a Primarch Horus? Many will say that the clone had only just awoken, that it was confused, or it did not wish to slay its sons, as it felt an intrinsic similarity with them. A bond? Alas, I cannot agree. At the present, I feel that there is one simple reason that Abaddon could best the simulacrum of his father. Experience. Abaddon, even then, had centuries of experience and a mindset that was honed by that time. Simply put, it does not always matter the innate ability of a combatant if they are overmatched so catastrophically by a person who has experience and regular practice. And that is one thing Abaddon has endlessly. Practice. He knows his trade. Abaddon has been waging the long war for ten millennia. He has played the great game and come out with it with the support of all four of the major powers of the warp. Yet he has actually bent the knee to none of them. This shows character. This shows that the time that Abaddon was in seclusion, he really did something that nobody wishes to give him credit for. He changed. Gone was the bellowing braggart who solved every situation with power claws. No. Abaddon became a leader. To play the great game and remain independent. To deal with gods and not become a thrall. Now that is will. That is power. More than this, much more. Abaddon the Despoiler has slowly accumulated more and more power as well. Not only in men and materials of war, but personally. For Abaddon wields a blade of such power, such evil, that not even the master of mankind, the Emperor, could destroy it. Abaddon wields the sword, Jack Nguyen, the first blade, the echo of the first evil. For this is the very weapon that was used by Cain to slay his brother Abel. The first murder. The first evil performed by mankind. Its resonance has driven men to war. Its presence has unmanned even custodies. Its power is second to none. And with it, Abaddon is elevated. His experience, his ability, his weaponry, his dark blessings from the gods make him more, so much more, than just the ex-captain of the Lunar Wolves 
or the sons of Horus. They make him a potential threat even to a Primarch. An end quote to leave you all on. A moment myself and another of the Baldemati were discussing, for we feel it sums it all up perfectly. To quote... Across the Black Fleet, plasma drives blazed as soon as the last dropships were aboard, pulling away from atmosphere at whatever speed their captains could urge. As the vengeful spirit led the exodus, Abaddon beheld the blue-grey orb of Cadia one last time. For ten thousand years, that world had been as much his foe as the warriors that garrisoned its fortresses. But nothing defied the will of chaos forever. Nothing defied his will forever. Loosing a peal of dark laughter, the despoiler decanted a draught of bulk wine into a chalice fashioned from the skull of Fabius Bile's clone of Horus and toasted the death of one ancient foe with the remains of another. End.